Where is it? Assalamu alaikum, dear students. Uh, welcome to our today's class. Uh, in our class lecture classes in gastroenterology, when we uh, were taking class in the lecture class, uh, in one class we discussed about the symptoms of uh, diseases related to gastroenterology. In that lecture class, we have shown that there are a lot of symptoms uh, that arises in the diseases of gastroenterology uh, like abdominal pain, dysphagia, dyspepsia, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, weight loss and GI bleeding. But look at the top, at the number one, it is abdominal pain because it is very common. Abdominal pain is very common. Uh, in your clinical practice, we will find that a lot of patients every day will come to you with the symptoms of abdominal pain. So we have uh, decided to discuss about abdominal pain a, bi a bit elaborately. So our two days, in our two days lecture, we'll concentrate on abdominal pain. Abdominal pain are of several types. They are visceral pain, they are parietal pain, referred pain, and psychogenic pain. Visceral pain, the name itself uh, defines that the pain is arising from the viscera. So pain arising from the viscera as well as the visceral uh, peritoneum. Visceral pain comes from internal organs and visceral peritoneum. It is gradual in onset and longer in duration. It is a dull pain, cramping or burning in nature, and it is uh, poorly localized. If you ask the patient to describe his pain, the patient at first will tell that it is not a sharp pain, it is a dull pain for prolonged period and gradually the intensity is increasing. The onset is not sudden, it is gradually increasing and if you ask to locate your pain, it will be a bit difficult for the patient because it is poorly localized. Visceral pain is poorly localized. Our uh, organs in the abdomen are not sensitive to cutting or burning. They are sensitive to stretching. So sensitive to stretching of the walls of hollow organs. When the walls of the hollow organs are st stressed, stressed may be due to air, may be due to uh, luminal content. If it is stressed, it will create pain. And those are the solid organs. They have got capsule. If there is any stretching over the capsule, it will create pain. So this is visceral pain arising from the viscera as well as the visceral peritoneum. Uh, if you look at the picture, these are the site of visceral pain from the epigastrium, from periumbilical region, and also from the hypogastrium. And this distribution is uh, from the embryonic development. When uh, the structure which has developed from the foregut, when affected, give rise to pain to epigastrium. The structure which are developed from the mid gut, you can see over here, these structures develop from the foregut, these structures develop from the mid gut, and these structures develop from the hind gut. So from the mid gut structure, pain will occur at the periumbilical area. And from the hind gut structure, pain will be below the umbilicus. It will be below the umbilicus. So if you just go through these lines, foregut structures like stomach, duodenum, liver, biliary tract, and pancreas produce upper abdominal pain, whereas mid-gut structure like small bowel, appendix, and proximal colon causes periumbilical pain, and hindgut structure like distal colon and geni genitourinary system cause lower abdominal pain, which are infraumbilical. 
The other type of abdominal pain is somatic pain. Somatic pain, we know that the abdominal wall as well as the parietal peri peritoneum has somatic nerve innervation. So they are uh, sensitive uh, to pain and they uh, give rise to somatic pain. The difference with visceral pain is that somatic pain is sudden or rapid in onset and sharp pain. These are sharp pain and they are more localized. Patient can easily localize the pain. And there are some cardinal signs for somatic pain like tenderness, rebound tenderness, muscle guard, and absent bowel sound. So if you just think what are the difference between the visceral pain and somatic pain, in visceral pain it was dull pain, gradual in onset, not that severe, poorly localized, arising from the viscera and visceral peritoneum. In case of somatic pain, it is a sharp pain, sudden in onset or rapid in onset, easily localized and arising from the abdominal wall and parietal peritoneum. It has got some cardinal features like tenderness, rebound tenderness, muscle guard, and absent bowel sound. Some pain has a contribution from both visceral and somatic type of pain like it starts as visceral pain then gradually it becomes somatic pain begin with visceral pain and progress to somatic pain we can take some example like in case of acute appendicitis we used to say that the pain of acute ap ap uh, appendicitis is periumbilical then it settles to the right iliac fossa but why it happens because the pain in early appendicitis is often periumbilical. It is visceral pain, but it localizes to the right lower quadrant when the uh, inflammation also involves the peritoneum. Uh, the pain in, uh, is localized at the right lower abdomen uh, and it is somatic pain due to the in involvement of the parietal peritoneum. We can take another example from cholecystitis where you will see that cholecystitis may begin as epigastric, which is visceral pain, and progress to right upper quadrant, which is somatic pain. And then it is referred to the shoulder. It is referred pain. So cholecystitis uh, giving uh, rise of at first visceral pain, then somatic pain, and then it has got referred pain. If you think what is referred pain, then you'll find that the pain perceived at a location other than the site of the painful stimulus or origin. Pain is perceived at a location other than the site of the painful stimulus or origin. So the pain is perceived in other area. It is not at the area of the uh, involvement of the disease or origin. It is referred to another point and it is the result of interconnecting sensory nerves supplying many different tissues. So there are some sensory nerves which are interconnected with each other and due to this interconnection, uh, these, when the, these nerves are supplying different types of tissues, when pain arises, the pain may refer from one set to another set. So these are referred pain. It's a very important picture for uh, you because uh, it, this picture uh, beautifully shows uh, the sites of referred pain in a different part of the body arising from the different organs. Uh, it is uh, well known, it is well known that we know that the cardiac pain occurs in the left side of the chest, then it radiates to the hand. So uh, this is a referred pain. Similar things occurs uh, when any organ in the abdomen is also uh, affected. Like you see, if the esophagus is uh, involved with any uh, pathology giving rise to pain, the pain will radiate to, uh, uh, refer to epigastrium, then central chest, left side of the chest, even up to the axilla. So this is the site of referred pain for esophagus. In the case of stomach, the pain is in the epigastrium, but the pain can refer to the back, between two scapula. It can refer to the back. It is a referred pain. In case of acute pancreatitis, 
the pain is in the epigastrium and the pain directly passes to the back. So this is another referred pain. In case of acute appendicitis, the pain initially at periumbilical area, then it goes to the right iliac fossa. In case of renal pain, you'll find that the pain is radiating from the loin towards the groin. Pain was initially at the loin, then it is radiating towards the groin as well as both sides of the thigh. So these are very important uh, clinical findings because these referred pain will uh, give you very important guide for the diagnosis uh, to reach to the diagnosis. Because uh, it is very common that the patient with uh, cholecystitis, gallbladder pain, will come to you with some referred pain at the shoulder. As well as in case of hepatitis, when the liver is inflamed, patient will give you some complaint of shoulder pain. So referred pain is very common and it is also a very important diagnostic clue. It is also a picture for referred pain where uh, it, it is showing the characteristic radiation of pain from the gallbladder, diaphragm and ureters. So you see it, this is gallbladder, this is the inflamed area, pain of gallbladder is over here and it is radiated to the tip of the scapula in the back. Pain from the diaphragm is going to the right shoulder and pain from the ureter is radiating to the inguinal area, inguinal area up to the scrotum. So these are the some these are some examples of referred pain. Abdominal pain can be acute or it can be chronic or recurrent. Some patient will come to you with a uh, shorter history. So some will come with a longer history. Some will come with history of recurrent abdominal pain. If you think about why the pain are occurring in the abdomen, you will uh, be able to classify those causes into into few points. Like some are inflammatory cause, some uh, some are due to perforation, some are due to obstruction of any hollow viscous, and there are some external intestinal causes as well. Then what are the inflammatory causes? Inflammatory causes are very common which are giving rise to uh, abdominal pain. A very common one is appendicitis. You can see here that the inflamed uh, swollen edematous appendix. So it can give rise to severe marked right lower abdominal pain. So it, this is appendicitis. Maybe cholecystitis, if the gallbladder is inflamed, it can give rise to uh, abdominal pain. Uh, pancreatitis, this is pancreas, you can see some uh, pathology over here, there is some edema. So it is a case of pancreatitis, uh, in, it is an inflammatory lesion and giving rise to marked abdominal pain. Sometimes the kidney as well as the renal uh, pelvis is infected or inflamed, it can give rise to pain, these are pyelonephritis. Diverticulitis are the inflammation of the diverticula. Sometimes there are some anatomical abnormality in the colon where there is outpulsing of the mucosal lining of the colon, which are known as diverticula. And if there are, if any inflammation occurs at those diverticula, it can give rise to abdominal pain and these are diverticulitis. Apart from that, any intraabdominal abscess formation and pelvic inflammatory disease in case of female gives rise to abdominal pain. The other causes are perforation or rupture. Peptic acid perforation is the commonest one among the uh, causes of perforation. This You can see an endoscopic picture where there is a deep ulcer at the antrum of the stomach. So it, it can per perforate if not treated. So peptic ulcer disease is, is one cause. Twisted ovarian cyst. Twisted ovarian cyst is another cause. Um, of uh, abdominal pain. Diverticular disease, we are talking about diverticular a few minutes back. These are the, these small outpouching of mucosa are the diverticular. So diverticular disease, uh, as the, here, there is only mucosal uh, layer. 
the colon has got mucosa, submucosa, muscular layer, and serous layer, but uh, in diverticula, there is only mucosal layer. So it can perforate or rupture at any time, giving rise to perforation. And aortic aneurysm. Sometimes there is aortic aneurysm if the aneurysm is large enough, uh, causing stretching over the wall of the uh, aorta can rupture, giving rise to uh, ruptured aortic aneurysm. So these are the causes of perforation or, or, or rupture that giving rise to abdominal pain. There are some obstructive causes. Obstructive causes, there is luminal obstruction. And these uh, causes usually gives rise to marked abdominal pain. Especially, you can uh, look here, the ureter is obstructed by a stone, ureteric calculi. Over here, uh, and here, you can see that there is, at the basic ureteric junction, a stone is over there, giving rise to obstruction. And these are very severe, causes of very severe abdominal pain, sharp pain and very severe pain. Here, there is also the stone in the common bile duct, stone in the gallbladder as well as stone in the common bile duct, polytocolithiasis, and it also gives rise to severe abdominal pain. And there is some obstruction in the large colon. Here, you can see due to a growth, there is obstruction of the large colon. And it is also giving rise to a luminal obstruction and it can cause severe abdominal pain. So, we were talking about acute uh, abdominal pain. Now, let us focus on some causes of chronic abdominal pain. Chronic abdominal pain, commonly we find uh, chronic pancreatitis, we find peptic ulcer disease. Uh, because these diseases can uh, make a person suffering for months or years. Uh, there may be intra-abdominal malignancy, which is also common. Abdominal tuberculosis, patient used to suffer for several months. Gastric outlet obstruction, uh, it occurs due to the complication of long-term peptic ulcer disease causing narrowing at the uh, outlet of the stomach. So it is gastric outlet obstruction. And subacute intestinal obstruction. If there is any intestinal obstruction, luminal narrowing, so food particle cannot pass through the narrowed lumen and gives rise to pain. So there are a lot of causes, but these are the commonly uh, common clinical uh, scenario that we used to find in the ward uh, in our day-to-day -day practice. But there are some lot of other uh, less common causes. So let us proceed to how to evaluate, how to evaluate. There are a lot of causes of abdominal pain, but we need to evaluate. And what is the way that we can uh, evaluate uh, the cause of abdominal pain in a systematic way? So to evaluate the cause of abdominal pain, we have to, we need to uh, get some answer from the patient. We have some question and we need to have some answer. So at first we used to ask, where is your pain? So where is your pain means site, site of location of the pain. Because we know that the, uh, every anatomical structure has got its own space in the abdomen. So if you know the site of the pain, then you can easily uh, think about uh, from where the pain is coming. So normally what happens? Normally with the midclavicular line, the subcostal plane and inter uh, trochanteric line, the abdomen is distributed into nine segments. Abdomen is distributed into nine segments. They are right and left hypochondrium, right and left lumbar region, right and left iliac fossa, epigastric region, umbilicus and hypogastric, umbilical area and hypogastric region. So these are the nine segments. So, and every segment has got its own anatomical structure. So if you can locate the site of the pain from the patient, then you can easily imagine the source of the pain. In the other words, abdomen can also be divided into four quadrants by the midline and by the trans umbilical line. So it is right and left upper quadrant, right and left lower quadrant. So if the patient can locate the site of the pain, you can uh, think about your differential diagnosis. It narrows your differential diagnosis. How did the pain begin? How long have you had the pain? So whether the pain is uh, of short duration 
or it is of longer duration, uh, whether it is acute or it is chronic. So these are the uh, question you have to ask the patient because some pain like perforation of abdominal of, uh, gas containing hollow viscous, the patient will say that it is a sudden pain of very short period. Whereas in case of just a peptical surgery, the patient will say that I have pain for several months. Uh, so uh, duration is very important. Then you will ask whether the pain radiates to anywhere, whether it is a localized pain or it radiates to some part of the body. A few minutes back, we are talking about the radiation. We, we uh, have shown that the pain of gallbladder is radiating to the tip of the scapula of right side and, and to the right shoulder. Pain of pancreas is radiating to the back. Uh, so you can easily understand that radiation, uh, the information about the radiation will give you a very important diagnostic clue. How does the pain feel like? What is the nature of the pain? What is the pattern of the pain? Uh, whether it is a sharp pain or it is a dull pain, whether uh, it is a, a burning sensation or it is a colicky pain. So the type of the pain will also give you some clue for the uh, to reach to the diagnosis. Whether it is uh, uh, colicky means uh, the pain which is coming from the abdominal hollow viscous. Burning pain may come due from peptic ulcer disease. A constant pain over the abdomen can come from a solid organ. So uh, you have to ask the patient, how does the pain feel like? Then you ask, the, ask about the severity of the pain because all pain are not severe. Like if we think about the epigastric pain, Peptical cyst disease pain is mild to moderate pain, but pancreatitis pain is a severe pain. So stone in the common bile duct, CVD. So it is the pain is very severe. Ruptured aortic aneurysm, a very severe tearing type pain. So uh, severity is very important. And to uh, uh, make the patient a bit comfortable in his answer, you can you can ask if unbearable pain is scoring 10 then what is the score of your pain you can scale it between 0 to 10 scale the pain between 0 to 10 where at 0 there is no pain and at 10 it is unbearable so patient if the patient can score the pain you can assess the severity then you ask does anything make the pain better or does anything make the pain worse? Yes, obviously, these are the precipitating factor and aggravating factor. Like in case of cholecystitis, you'll find it that fatty food increasing the pain. In case of pancreatitis, fatty food and pro protein rich food increasing the pain. In case of gastric ulcer disease, the patient will say that pain increases after taking meal. But on the other hand, in case of duodenal ulcer, the patient will say that my pain is relieved after taking food. Patient with gastric ulcer will say that after vomiting, the pain subsides. Patient of gastric artery obstruction will say after vomiting, I feel comfortable. So there are some, always there are some precipitating factors and there are some aggravating factors. And we have to ask the patient about it. Otherwise, we'll miss it. Then we will also ask, do you have any other symptom? Because the abdominal pain may have associated with other symptoms. Like some patient will say, sir, we are, I have vomiting together with the pain. So if there is vomiting, if it, there is regular vomiting, like every day there is history of vomiting at the evening time. So you will obviously think about gastric artery obstruction. Some uh, patient may have also proximal small intestinal obstruction associated with vomiting some patient can say sir i have got weight loss so if there is weight loss elderly patient you will have to exclude malignancy some patient may say sir i have vomiting together with uh, the vomit i have sorry i have blood mixed with vomitus or some may say i have melena in those cases you have to think about a bleeding peptic ulcer disease as well as it is a duty to exclude malignancy so associated symptoms are very important. 
so if you think about those uh, character of those pain and use those as diagnostic clue then you will find that sometimes the pain is abrupt and excruciating pain very uh, it is very difficult to tolerate that it is unbearable pain if it happens like that you have to exclude biliary colic you have to exclude ureteric colic you have to exclude myocardial infarction because pain of myocardial infarction can radiate to the upper abdomen and we need to exclude perforated ulcer as well as ruptured aneurysm so these are the causes that can give rise to unbearable excruciating pain and abrupt in origin then if you look on this side uh, you'll find there are some uh, history of rapid onset of severe pain but constant pain so it, it might be a case of acute pancreatitis if the pain is in epigastrium if it is periumbilical then there is some mesenteric thrombosis or strangulated bowel and in case of female always keep in in your mind that in a female of childbearing age if come comes to you with severe abdominal pain it is mandatory that you exclude ectopic pregnancy then uh, some pain will be gradual in onset and there is steady pain if the pain is gradual in onset and steady pain then it can be if, if the location is right upper abdomen then it can be cholecystitis cholangitis or acute hepatitis if it is at the right lower abdomen uh, like right iliac fossa, then it can be appendicitis or acute salpingitis. If it is in the left side of the lower abdomen, you have to exclude diverticulitis. So you see how the character of the pain, together with the anatomical distribution, helping you to reach to the diagnosis. If you just correlate between the type of the pain and the anatomical distribution, it is very easy to uh, shorten your differential diagnosis. You will find that some pain are intermittent, colicky, and uh, there are some pain-free intervals between the attack of pain. Colicky pain means it is uh, there is obstruction in a hollow viscous. So uh, small bowel obstruction will give rise to periumbilical colicky pain. Small bowel obstruction will give rise to periumbilical colicky pain and inflammatory bowel disease will give rise to lower abdominal hypogastric lower abdominal colicky pain. So this is how the distribution as well as the character of pain will help you to reach to your diagnosis. Now physical examination. We are uh, talking about, at first we are talking about the type of abdominal pain, then we are concentrating, concentrating about the uh, distribution and size of those pain with the help of the history that we need to take from the patient. We are talking about specific questions that we have to ask the patient uh, and those answers are very important for us uh, to restore our diagnosis. Now it is time to examine the patient. To examine the patient, first of all, we have to go for the vital signs because a patient came to you. It is not only that you are going to diagnose the patient, it is uh, our duty to treat the patient also. So assessment of vital sign is very important at the very beginning. Uh, we have to see that the patient has got a regular normal pulse a normal blood pressure, normal breathing pattern. He is taking breath, uh, respiratory uh, respiration comfortably and spontaneously without any added support and we have to also see the temperature of the patient because uh, some causes of abdominal pain are associated with the fever so we have to measure the temperature of the patient as well so this is the assessment of vital signs then look at the general appearance of the patient whether uh, he is in looking whether he is toxic because in some cases of uh, severe abdominal pain patient will may become toxic or uh, some causes of abdominal pain can even give rise to uh, septicemia the patient will become toxic 
like suppose a patient came to you with perforated uh, hollow viscous patient uh, may develop a septicemia so patient will be toxic so general appearance is very important then inspection of the abdomen sometimes you will find that the abdomen is distended when you will find it suppose a case of intestinal obstruction you will find the abdomen is distended a case of uh, perforation of gas containing hollow viscous there will be a distension of the abdomen you will look for any scar over the abdomen maybe uh, some you may get some surgical scar for previous surgery will give rise uh, will give you some clue suppose uh, there may be post surgical band and adhesion so scar is very important look for scar on the abdomen look for the visible peristalsis if there is any visible peristalsis it will give you a clue about intestinal obstruction look at the breathing pattern sometimes a patient with severe abdominal pain you will find that the patient uh, is taking respiration very cautious so that he is not moving the abdomen he is not there is absence of uh, abdominal movement during respiration it happens when the peritoneum is inflamed with the respiration the patient feels severe pain so he tries to take breathing without moving the abdomen to see the breathing pattern if there is absence of abdominal movement you will think that there is some peritonitis look for any bruise we'll discuss later that there are some bruises which are accompanied with some type of abdominal pain so you look for any presence of any bruise and look for any visible mass if there are any visible mass at the abdomen it will suggest you uh, some causes of obstruction so these are the things you have to look uh, at the abdomen uh, during inspection then you palpate the patient and see if there is any tenderness because if there is any inflamed structure in the abdomen it will elicit uh, pain during your palpation which is known as tenderness so tenderness can be elicited but before going for tenderness uh, please ask the patient first uh, where is your pain locate your pain because you have to reach at the point of pain at the end of your palpation do not start your palp palpation uh, from the point of pain because in that case the patient will spontaneously uh, contract the muscles of the abdomen and you will not be able to palpate it again so come to the point of tenderness at the end of your palpation so ask the patient please show me where is your pain and start from uh, the distal point so that you can come to the point of tenderness at the end then rebound tenderness rebound tenderness uh, is elicited by the uh, if there is peritonitis uh, we gently we gently above and uh, we press the abdomen uh, with our palm of the hand then uh, suddenly we release our hand we press it very gently so that the patient uh, doesn't feel any pain but suddenly we release the hand and if the patient feels pain when i suddenly release the pain then it is the rebound tenderness positive it occurs if there is uh, peritonitis may be generalized or localized muscle guard muscle guard is present uh, over any inflamed organ or structure uh, it is involuntary muscle guard is involuntary it occurs due to uh, it uh, to save the inflamed stru structure within the abdomen uh, so you when you will palpate the abdomen if you get muscle uh, uh, guard in any part of the abdomen you will think that there is some inflamed structure beneath that muscular layer sometimes the muscle guard becomes uh, generalized the whole of the abdomen uh, becomes rigid and uh, it is known as rigidity when the muscle guard is generalized over a whole of the abdomen we call it rigidity a very common cause of rigidity is perforation of gas containing hollow viscous and otherwise muscle guard can be present in other uh, causes like in case of cholecystitis in the right upper abdomen in uh, appendicitis in the right lower abdomen so muscle guard is localized uh, guarding gardening and rigidity is generalized muscle guard but both of them are involuntary then we will look for any palpable lump if there are any palpable lump like in case of uh, 
appendicitis we may get a, a appendicular lump it is possible to get appendicular lump in the right lower abdomen in case of intestinal obstruction due due to any growth uh, or tuberculosis we might get a lump if we palpate the abdomen so please look uh, for a palpable lump during your palpation then try to elicit the percussion note percussion note in in uh, because uh, it has some very important clinical uh, use. In case of uh, intestinal obstruction, we'll get the abdomen it has become resonant. In case of perforation of gas containing intestinal hollow viscous, the percussion node will become uh, hyper resonant and there will be loss of normal liver dullness. If you percuss over the uh, uh, liver dullness, over the area of liver dullness, you'll find that in case of perforation, there is loss of normal liver dullness due to the presence of air over there. So percussion is very important. It is also important to differentiate between whether the uh, abdominal distension is due to any air or it is due to fluid like ascites. So percussion is uh, important and you have to uh, percuss the abdomen of the patient very uh, attentively so that you do not miss any important point. Then comes auscultation, auscultation of the abdomen. Uh, normally, a uh, normal person has got some bowel sound, normal bowel sound, but in case of intestinal obstruction, you will find that the uh, uh, there is high pitch. If there is small intestinal obstruction, you will find high pitch barbarygmy sound. High pitch barbarygmy sound in case of small intestinal obstruction, low pitch sound in large intestinal obstruction, and sometimes if there is any paralytic ileus, like uh, some diseases can give rise to paralytic ileus, there is no movement of the small and large intestine. Uh, so in that case, you will get that there is no bowel sound. Like in case of acute pancreatitis or in case of, uh, in case of uh, any perforation of gas containing abdominal hollow viscous, you will find that there is uh, no uh, sound, bowel sound, if you auscultate the patient. So auscultation is also very important. Yet just it is uh, to show you that uh, during palpation, you can LC tenderness in case of acute appendicitis. It is known as McBurney's point. And if a line is drawn between umbilicus and anterior superior iliac spine uh, at the lateral one third, at the junction of the medial, medial two third and lateral one third, at that junction point, it is the McBurney's point, and if you press over here, the patient will feel pain. And this is tenderness at the McBurney's point. So this is the site uh, of uh, pain in case of acute appendicitis. The picture showing muscle guard. When you try to palpate an abdomen over an inflamed organ, muscle over here will involuntarily contract, giving rise to muscle guard. On the other uh, side here, if you very gently press over an inflamed uh, area, uh, if peritonitis is over there, and if you suddenly release your hand, it will give rise to pain. So this is rebound tenderness. This was gardening, this was guarding, and this was this is rebound tenderness. There are some very important clinical signs in acute abdomen, like Murphy's sign. Robsing sign, SOAS sign, obturator sign, Poulin sign, a great turner sign. So, in case of acute cholecystitis, uh, if a thumb is placed over the right upper uh, quadrant at the site of the gallbladder, pressed and asks the patient to take deep breath, suddenly the patient will hold his breath due to pain. So this is known as Murphy's sign. Murphy's sign is a sign of acute cholecystitis. Patient will hold the breathing all in a sudden due to feeling of pain. So this is Murphy's sign. This is Robsing signs in case of acute appendicitis. If you palpate the left iliac fossa, the patient will feel the pain at right iliac fossa. This is a feature of acute appendicitis. You are pressing over here but the patient is feeling pain over here. Because when you are pressing on this side, the abdominal structures are pushed to that side and they are pressing over the inflamed appendix. So 
the patient will feel pain on the right side. This is Rob Singh's side. In case of acute appendicitis, if the patient is kept in left lateral position, hip is fixed and the lower limb is uh, pulled a bit backwards, it will cause pain at the side of the appendix. And this is SOAS sign. This is SOAS sign. It, SOAS sign is a sign of acute appendicitis. On the other hand, in case of acute appendicitis, if the hip is flexed and rotated inwards and outwards, then you will find that the patient is complaining of pain. This is known as obturator sign because the obturator muscle is over here. When you flex the hip and rotate it in and outward, the muscle will contract and uh, it, it will give pain at this area due to inflammation that came from the uh, inflamed appendix. So it is also a feature of, uh, obturator sign is also a feature of acute appendicitis. Next one is cool and sign. Cool and sign is a feature of acute pancreatitis. It is a feature of acute pancreatitis. There is some uh, bruising around the umbilicus. Uh, in case of severe acute pancreatitis, it occurs due to retroperitoneal hemorrhage. The other one is gray turner sign. There is a dusky bluish discoloration at the uh, right lower abdomen. So it is also a feature of pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis. So these are the signs, very important because they help us a lot to reach to the diagnosis. Like Murphy's sign for cholecystitis, Robson signs for appendicitis, SOAS sign for appendicitis, obturator sign for appendicitis, Coolen sign for acute pancreatitis, and a great turner sign for acute pancreatitis. These are very helpful signs to this to the diagnosis. Now we will think about investigation. We'll think about investigation. We have to do some investigation for our patient to confirm our clinical judgment. Uh, but always I want to say that whenever you, you get an elderly patient who came to you with abdominal pain, before going to any other investigation or, or management, please go for an ECG. It is your duty, it is your moral duty to exclude any cardiac uh, cause like myocardial infarction uh, before starting detailed evaluation of abdominal pain because pain of myocardial infarction radiates to the epigastrium also. If you miss it, if you miss that point, you, you, you might lose the patient as well. So always start with an ECG. If the ECG is, is normal, then you go for evaluation, evaluation of um, abdominal causes. Then we do some uh, blood tests like CBC. Here, there may be uh, ESR may be raised and patient may be anemic. Uh, in case of inflammatory causes, uh, the WC count will be more. Uh, look for the blood sugar, which will help you in case of management. Uh, as well as so we should mention that in case of acute pancreatitis, even a normal non-diabetic patient might have raised blood sugar. So you have to see the blood sugar level. Go for amylase and lipase to exclude uh, acute appendicitis because we know that the amylase and lipase are more uh, in case of, sorry, uh, acute pancreatitis, not appendicitis, pancreatitis. Amylase uh, normally rises, but it comes down within 24 to 48 hours, comes down to normal to within 24 to 48 hours, but lipase is elevated in the blood for two to three weeks. So if a patient of uh, severe upper abdominal pain uh, comes to you uh, after three to four days of the onset of pain, uh, serum lipase will be more important as a diagnostic clue because MLS will become normal within 48 hours. Then you go for liver function test like ALT, serum bilirubin, alkaline phosphate is in prothrombin time uh, to exclude hepatitis as well as uh, the uh, obstructive causes of the biliary tree. If there is any stone in the biliary tree, it can give rise to raised bilirubin uh, and as well as raised alkaline phosphatase. So liver function test is important for you. And then you go for serum electrolytes, which will help you for the management because uh, patients of uh, intestinal obstruction or gastric aortic obstruction or any other severe abdominal, uh, any other cases of severe abdominal pain used to vomit uh, time and again, repeated vomiting can cause hyponatremia. So you have to exclude the electrolyte imbalance. So you go for serum electrolytes. 
look at the picture here you can see this is a plain x-ray showing inverted crescentic gas shadow beneath the diaphragm on both sides so this this is an x-ray of perforation of gas containing intestinal hollow viscous there is inverted crescentic gas shadow on the right side you see there is uh, a radio of x shadow this is also a plain x-ray there is a radio of x shadow signifying there is a stone over here so this is how plain x-ray of abdomen will help you to uh, get a diagnosis here you see that there is distended gas containing bowel loops usually distended gas containing bowel loops and here are some very important features like air fluid level. This is a fluid level, this is air. This is fluid level, this is air. We used to call this air fluid level. So here is multiple air fluid level of here, here suggesting intestinal obstruction. Both these uh, x-ray are showing intestinal obstruction. Then we go for ultrasonography because ultrasonography gives us, us a lot of clue to reach to our diagnosis. Suppose in case of cholecystitis, in can, it can say that the gallbladder wall has become thick and or if there are any stone, it can mention that there is stone within the gallbladder. In case of pen, uh, appendicitis, it, it can say that the appendix is inflamed, swollen. Uh, in case of uh, pancreatitis, the ultrasound will mention the pancreas has become swollen and there is peripancreatic fluid collection. So this is how ultrasonography helps us a lot. We used to do ultrasonography in every case of abdominal pain. Then if you suspect that the uh, disease is lying within the GI tract, within the uh, esophageal stomach uh, or intestine, then we plan for upper GI endoscopy or colonoscopy. So uh, this is the picture showing uh, ulcer diagnosed during upper GI endoscopy at the entrance. This is the pyloric orifice. Just uh, proximal to the pyloric orifice, there is a a longitudinal long linear ulcer. It is diagnosed by the help of, with the help of endoscopy. So endoscopy and colonoscopy are two other modalities of test to reach to diagnosis of abdominal pain. If we could not reach to the diagnosis with all those previous investigations, then we'll uh, plan for some advanced investigation like CT scan, MRCP, and ERCP. Here you can see the CT scan showing multiple stone within the gallbladder. This is the gallbladder is showing multiple stone is within the gallbladder, which was the cause of abdominal pain in this patient. And this is a picture of MRCP. MRCP stands for Magnetic Resonant Cholangiopancreatogram. RCP stands for Endoscopic Retrograde Cholangiopancreatogram. So this is a picture of MRCP and you can see there is stone within the gallbladder as well as stones within the common bile duct. So it is it very clearly it is showing the cause of the pain of that patient. So CT scan, MRCP, and ERCP are also very useful tools to reach to a diagnosis. So just before uh, uh, ending our today's class, let us just uh, in very short, in very short, let us um, have a look about very common causes of upper abdominal pain. Uh, like peptic ulcer disease is a very common cause. The pain is gnawing type, aching type, or burning pain. Uh, and the pain is located in the epigastric region. Duodenal pain is subsided by taking food. Gastric pain is increased. Uh, gastric ulcer pain is increased by taking food. Duodenal pain usually occurs one to three hours after taking meal. And sometimes the patient used to wake up in the late night uh, from sleep due to pain. These are the history you normally a duodenal pain patient gives us. So pain in the epigastrium, growing or burning type of pain, not very severe, uh, is due to peptic ulcer disease pain. And in case of acute or chronic pancreatitis, here also the pain is in the epigastric region, but radiating to the back, radiating to the back, and the patient is uh, feeling comfortable while sitting and leaning forward. In lying position, pain is more. In leaning forward, pain is less. And his pain is aggravated by taking fat and protein. So this is the pain of pancreatitis. In the epigastric region, severe pain, more in the lying position, less in the sitting and leaning forward, and aggravated by fat and protein uh, food. In case of cholecystitis, yes, pain in the uh, right upper abdomen, a moderate intensity pain in the right hypochondriac area, which 
will radiate to the tip of the right scapula as well as the right shoulder and pain is triggered by fatty food. Here you will find that Murphy's sign is positive. So this is these are the feature of cholecystitis, right hypochondriac, so right hypochondriac pain radiating to the right shoulder or right tip of the right scapula aggravated by fatty food and when you will examine the patient you will find that Murphy's sign is positive. In case of appendicitis, by this time we have all already discussed, the pain uh, is moderate in intensity. Initially at the periumbilical area, later it is settled to the right iliac fossa. Patient may have some history of fever or vomiting and you will get that the McBurney's point is tender. So these are the features of acute appendicitis. In case of small intestinal obstruction, the pain is colicky in nature because it is a hollow viscous. It is a hollow viscous, the pain is colicky in nature, that is uh, you, the patient will have some pain free interval and when the pain appears it is a cramping type of pain, then gradually it again goes away and there is some interval. So it is colicky in nature, uh, small intestinal pain or peri, peri uh, umbilical uh, uh, in location, they are aggravated by taking food, uh, the patient may also complain of vomiting and constipation. The abdomen gradually becomes distended as there is obstruction and the patient is unable to uh, pass uh, fecal matter in regular intervals. So there is gradually there is uh, abdominal distension. If you examine the patient, you might see some visible peristalsis and the, these peristalsis are the center of the abdomen. In other words, it is known as step letter pattern of peristalsis. So you have all uh, you uh, should always search for visible peristalsis. And if you uh, auscultate the patient, you will find that there is high pitched barbaric sound. High pitched barbaric sound. So these are the feature of small intestinal obstruction. And the next one is a very uh, severe medical emergency, uh, or you can also say this is a, a severe uh, medical emergency that has to be managed by the uh, surgery soon. So it is. Uh, perforation of gas containing abdominal hollow viscous. If there is any perforation in a gas containing abdominal hollow viscous, commonest one is peptic ulcer perforation, but there are some other causes like enteric fever perforation at the ileum. So it is sudden onset. The onset is sudden and severe in intensity. Initially it is in epigastric region, but later it becomes diffuse. Starting from the epigastrium, but it becomes diffuse. Abdomen becomes distended because the patient develops paralytic ileus. So gradually the abdomen becomes distended. The patient stops the uh, respiratory movement of the abdomen due to severe pain. So no respiratory movement of abdomen. There is thoracic type of respiration, no thoracoabdominal type of respiration. There is marked tenderness over the abdomen and absence of liver dullness. If you percuss over the liver, there is absence of liver dullness due to presence of gas over there. Board-like rigidity is a very important finding in case of perforation of gas containing abdominal hollow viscous. Whole of the abdomen, you will, if you palpate, you will feel like a board, a board over there. The muscles are taut, whole of the abdomen becomes rigid and it is known as board-like rigidity. It is a very important clue and there will be absent bowel sound. So these are a very important clue for the diagnosis of perforation of gas containing abdominal hollow viscous. And this is a disease that you can never uh, miss the diagnosis because if you miss the diagnosis of the case of perforation of uh, hollow viscous, obviously the patient will go into sepsis, it will give rise to multi-organ multi failure and ultimately it will be very difficult to cure the patient. So diagnose, you cannot miss the diagnosis uh, of a case of perforation. So that was all from today. From my side, dear students, hope all of you are uh, fine and safe uh, in your house. Uh, you are passing good time with your family and also you are taking care of your study. See you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you for from uh, my side today. I love this.